Villa News Andrew Hood put together 2,000 words on why cycling's TV product needs to be improved, having been clubbed over the head by SportsCenter Monday Night Football in the World Series. What SportsCenter has to do with live event production, I'm not sure. It's a pre-recorded show with tight editing and excellent writing, of which I'm sure there are no equivalents whatsoever in the cycling world. <coughs> but then again, the article is full of incongruous blanket statements, like putting more money into production value and graphics. Dude, have you forgotten Velo Center? This was like the entire week in bike budget in 12 seconds. And what did that investment do for cycling exactly? Back page placement on Huffington Post? I mean, right now, the old velonews.tv URL redirects to competitor groups running videos page. In all seriousness, the analysis wavers between, well, duh, statements like we should open up team radio to the general audience, and technical inaccuracies like saying it would be expensive to add live GPS to a video feed. So saying broadcasters are out of touch is kind of calling the kettle black. If we want to prevent cycling from becoming a grandpa sport, is listening to grandpa really the best way to do that? <laughs> I could belabor the point by talking about the costs and benefits of TV coverage at the Quebec World Tour events, but instead I'd rather focus on Kalas NNOF Sophie de Boer continuing her run at the top of the B-Post Bank Trophy. She took what I believe is the first ever equal prize money for women at a European cyclocross event by winning the GP 2020 cycling at Koppenberg Cross, extending her lead at the front of that series. De Boer dropped out of the next day's Super Prestige in Zonhoven, but don't worry, that won't affect her run at the Super Prestige overall women's title, because there isn't one. I suppose I should count my blessings that Zonhoven even had a women's event this year, won by Enertherm BKCP, Sana Kant. The Super Prestige race did have a U23 field, though, won by Vosgood Service Golden Palace's Wout van Aert. This is kind of silly, because van Aert won the elite men's race at the previous day's Koppenberg Cross, under somewhat controversial circumstances that you can learn all about in the most recent How the Race Was Won. <coughs> Sven Nice was second both days. Kevin Powell's of Sunweb Napoleon Games beat him at Zonhoven, but the Kralon AA drink rider does still lead the overall in both season-long competitions. If you're looking to add your name to the storied and only occasionally revised list of hour record holders, you have between now and next summer, when Brad Wiggins will launch his attempt at the hour on the sunny island getaway of Majorca. But more interesting for me is that Wiggins plans to make an attempt at Paris-Roubaix first. The Briton finished with the favorites this past April despite not having done any real classics prep, with a healthy Ian Standard, Sky could make things very interesting next spring. But don't attribute my pep today to the prospect of the oncoming classic season. This week's t-shirt donor is Seattle-based Motofish Coffee. Operated out of the 1977 Mercedes Unimog styled on this shirt, Motofish can set up pretty much anywhere to serve their single-origin, third-wave brews. You can book the Mog from their website, and for when you can't make it to the truck, they've got nifty goodies, like this bean grinder and aeropress kit, which has been keeping me topped off all day. <coughs> Supplemental to the current whirling of the rider transfer merry-go-round, Shane Stokes of Cycling Tips has done some investigations into teams not paying their riders the UCI minimum. Basically, the scam is that teams do pay riders, but then force them to pay the money back, either under the table or as expenses like travel or lodging. The reflex to blame the UCI for this is very strong, but on closer inspection, it looks kind of like tax fraud, something that governments rather than governing bodies are better set up to handle. Another not entirely on the level pay tactic discussed in the article involves sponsors and riders functioning as a sort of package deal, which doesn't really make sense to me. At the end of the day, if sponsors are looking for exposure, aren't they incentivized to create the winningest team they can? Is this a tacit admission that winning is effectively irrelevant to the return sponsors see on their investment? Certainly race results don't seem to move the bottom line much for the Italian media, who continue to press on with their non-stop train of Pantani-related nonsense. This is despite, you know, the existence of a really simple and factually substantiated explanation for the Italian's death. It's tempting, especially in the light of Michele Acquarone's continued battle with RCS, to attribute this as some sort of nationalistic problem on Italy's part. But then you read something like this Het Nisblat story about a cycling doping ring being broken up, except that only most of the athletes involved are cyclists, and none of them are facing criminal charges. And they could also possibly just be witnesses. And add to that that Johnny Hoogerland has finally received a payout for being launched into a barbed wire fence by an errant car at the Tour de France just three short years later, and that makes for race organizers, media, sponsors, and teams operating at a pretty substandard level in cycling. So with that in mind, why are we expecting the corresponding TV coverage to be first rate? <coughs> I'm Cosmo Catalano, and that was The Week in Bike.